We are proud members of the Spy Podcast Network. Find out more at www.spypodcasts.com. Due to the themes of this podcast, listener discretion is advised. He started asking me questions. So I was sitting I was sitting there in the table with him and he said, "So, why are you in the Netherlands? Lock your doors, close the blinds, change your passwords. This is Secrets and Spies." Secrets and Spies is a podcast that dives into the world of espionage, terrorism, geopolitics, and intrigue. This podcast is produced and hosted by Chris Carr. On today's podcast, I'm joined by Eldad Ben Aaron. Eldad is a PhD scholar of international relations who works primarily on the Middle East. We discuss the challenges of researching intelligence history in Israel and the importance of first-person interviews with members of the intelligence community. This episode will probably be of interest in particular to students of international relations and intelligence history, so I hope you enjoy this episode. Just before we begin, we now have a YouTube channel. I've been threatening it for a while, and now we have it. So please follow the link below in the show notes and subscribe to our YouTube channel. And there are video versions of the podcast. So if you like to see a squiggly line with your interviews, you can now see a squiggly line on YouTube. If you wish to support the podcast, there are a few options for you. You can become a Patreon subscriber and directly support the show for three pounds a month. We also have a merchandise store at Redbubble. We have cups, coasters, water bottles, and tote bags, all available on the Redbubble store. Also, if you enjoy this episode, please share it on social media among friends, family, colleagues, cohorts. And lastly, please leave a review on your podcast app. All reviews help the show get discovered by other people. Apple Podcasts in particular love reviews, and they really help this show get featured on the app. So please do leave a review. All the links are available in the show notes below. Thank you so much for your support. And without further ado, let's get going. The opinions expressed by guests on Secrets and Spies do not necessarily represent those of the producers and sponsors of this podcast. Eldad, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for extending this kind invitation, Chris. It's great to be in your podcast. Well, thank you for joining me today. For the benefit of the audience, please can you just tell us a little bit about yourself? I'm an uh, historian of international relations who work primarily on the Middle East in the 20th century. As an area expert, uh, my research lies at the intersection between international history, uh, Cold War studies, uh, geopolitics, uh, all interviews, and critical security studies. I'm currently working on developing new and exciting uh, research project about Israel's foreign policy in uh, South Caucasus, uh, specifically re-examination of uh, the geopolitical puzzle in the uh, Nagorno-Karabakh conflict between Azerbaijan and uh, Republic of Armenia. Israel, uh, together with Turkey and Iran, are deeply involved in this conflict, which uh, promises uh, new and exciting insights. I was born and raised in Jerusalem, uh, Israel, and uh, since 2012, I'm a resident of uh, the Netherlands. I came to uh, the Netherlands initially to study a, a unique master program uh, at the University of Amsterdam in Holocaust and Genocide Studies. After obtaining my master's, I started a PhD in history at the Royal Holloway, University of London, and uh, obtained it in uh, 2019. Since then, I've been working as a postdoc at the Proof Research Institute uh, in Frankfurt and uh, also uh, working as a lecturer in several Dutch universities. Again, uh, I'm really excited to be here uh, today and uh, looking forward to our conversation. Yeah, fantastic. One random question. Um, are you a keen cyclist living in Amsterdam? Keen, I won't say keen, <laughs> but uh, I, first of all, yeah, it's, it's a really good question. Uh, I, I used to cycle quite a lot as a child in Jerusalem, even though Jerusalem is uh, built on mountains. 
Yeah. Um, but relatively, we, we, we cycled a lot back then. So I knew how to cycle already. But uh, to be honest, uh, the, the, the cycling culture in uh, Holland and especially in Amsterdam is quite uh, brutal. <laughs> yeah, it's like, it's, it's, uh, you have to find your leader. into it yeah yeah but yeah. I'm, i'm cycling every day with a huge uh, buck fits they call it it's like a three-wheel fits which you fit your kids in and you take them to school you drive them back my older son know, know already how to cycle so sometimes i just take one of them and the other one is cycling next to me but uh yeah it is Yeah, yeah. Oh, man, when I was a kid, I used to love cycling, but since being in London, I'm scared of it now. It's just the traffic is just too much. It's I can't imagine. Buses, lorries. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. yeah. <laughs> And even though, you know, there, there are bicycle paths everywhere. You can uh, always find your your uh, safe spot on the road. I mean, mm. it's still, uh, it could be quite dangerous, mm, mm. especially when scooters come uh, also enjoying the, the bicycle path. Mm, mm. So, yeah, it could be... It could be hectic. <laughs> Thank you for that. Eldad, you've written this brilliant piece called Methodological and Epistemological Reflections on Elite Interviews and the Study of Israeli Intelligence History. And you've also got an interview with Ephraim Halavi, who was head of Mossad in that piece. So what is it that drew you to the topic of Israel's intelligence history? I think that I uh, was always, as a, as a child who grew up in Israel, uh, we all... always heard about the stories about the Mossad and the mm. and how prestigious it is how secret it is um, we all heard about uh, the secret uh, operation to kidnap Eichmann in the late, late 50s and bring him to trial in Israel in the early 60s so this uh, glory behind the Mossad and uh, and, and the secrecy of this institution always drove me to this uh, Uh, to this world um, and I think the other part of it is that uh, I always uh, uh, that maybe this this angle of, of uh, being passionate about uh, the diplomatic history and intelligence history is mm-hmm. about mm-hmm. me as an investigator as, as a scholar I always seek to know more about what I'm uh, hearing or and I'm, I'm challenging or I'm trying to be critical about the sources of information I get Um, so I always found myself uh, I, like want to know more so that's I mean that part of me that part of me the, the scholar part of me put me in a position where I would like to to study intelligence and and study study a diplomatic history yeah yeah I could relate to that yeah <laughs> yeah I mean like you know being British growing up with like obviously the myth of James Bond and mi6 and all that and, uh-huh. uh, in particular the town I grew up in which has a few intelligence connections as I got older I realized it's yeah there's sort of a, there is a mythology around sort of uh, intelligence services in certain cultures that just draw you to it and uh, yeah I can relate to what you're saying there yes <laughs> Well, I was going to ask, um, could you give us a rough guide to the different intelligence services of Israel and their kind of areas of responsibility and how they kind of interact with government? Sure, sure. So, I mean, the, the first and the most famous one, I think, is the Mossad. Mm-hmm. Most people are familiar with the Mossad, uh, but they, they basically, their realm of, uh, let's say, responsibility is uh, to collect intelligence abroad. So, mm-hmm. outside the borders of Israel. Let's put it this way. Mm. And then we have uh, HaShabak, or Shorut HaBitachon HaKlali in Hebrew. It's a bit uh, difficult words yeah. to pronounce, so I'm going to say them again slowly. So Shorut HaBitachon HaKlali collect domestic intelligence mm. within the borders of Israel, but that's including also, for example, uh, the West Bank. So it's, it's not within the former borders of Israel, but, uh, well, it's... it's debatable but so they're responsible for collecting intelligence uh, uh, domestically so the third intelligence entity is Aman which uh, collect intelligence for the military and then the fourth one is uh, the Israeli Ministry of Foreign Affairs Center for uh, policy research and they are responsible for collecting intelligence for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs so this I would say main four uh, institutions entities that uh, responsible for Uh, separately and collectively to collect intelligence but I think the most interesting point about the whole thing is that they have uh, quite a lot of competition between these institutions especially between the Mossad and the foreign ministry and they try to of course uh, 
uh, compete on, on the influence mm. about decision making. In that regard, the Mossad has a lot of advantage because uh, they are they can ask from everyone else to share intelligence with them. They're on top of the hierarchy. They don't have to share intelligence with anyone else. They are all being, let's say, they all have to report to the prime minister. So in that sense, the prime minister and of course the government. But that's the, that's the, I would say, the hierarchy. The Mossad is on top. The Minister of Foreign Affairs is really uh, the, on the last tier of those, uh, of this hierarchy. Um, and in between is uh, Sherwood Abitachon, clearly, the domestic intelligence. One question, actually, is there much information about how the intelligence is sort of then presented to the Prime Minister? Is there like a process that they have to go through? Yeah, I think that this part is covered uh, by the weekly meeting they have between the Prime Minister and each of those intelligence uh, institutions mm. with, with the Prime Minister. So they have a weekly meeting, they brief him, and they talk about important matters, they share their uh, knowledge with him. I mean, I think they also give some recommendations uh, which he needs to take uh, to his coalition, to his government, and uh, they have to accept or not accept some of the advice they get Yeah, and uh, decide on the action plan. It's been done on uh, a weekly basis. I think in intense periods, maybe even uh, on a daily basis or in even more. I mean, the defense cabinet, they meet once in a certain period, but in a, in very, let's say, tense period. Uh, for example, there are rounds of uh, war in Gaza mm-hmm. or a war against Hezbollah. So we are talking about daily, daily briefings and uh, even on... On the matters of hours, I think. Uh, so it really depends on the period, but they have their own routine. Yeah, yeah, cool. Thank you for that. So in your in your piece, you refer to the study of intelligence based on the experiences of the Anglo-Saxon world, i.e. the Anglosphere, specifically UK, United States, Canada, Australia, New Zealand. So how does Israel fit into this history? Because it's located, obviously, in the Arab Middle East, but in t- Israeli's intelligence culture is very much influenced by the Anglo-Saxon world yeah that's a great question i i think it's really interesting and uh, we don't know enough about it mm. i mean this piece i try you know really to to start discussing it a little bit and and flesh out a bit you know this big question um but this is a really interesting uh, borderline case study because as as you, you rightly mentioned israel is uh, located geographically in the middle east in the arab middle east but culturally it belongs somewhat to the West. It got a lot of Western influence, especially on, on daily culture. Um, and of course, that feeds into uh, institutional culture as well. Um, one example I can give you that uh, I read in so many uh, autobiographies of former Mossad uh, officials, for example, this one by uh, Shabtai Shavit, who is the uh, sixth uh, uh, head of the Mossad, and mm. he, he tells uh, his story that uh, he went in 1986. He, he took his family with him for one year of a sabbatical and studied uh, public MBA uh, pub- in public administration in Harvard. And he explains that this experience influenced him a lot, not only in terms of the knowledge he obtained in the studies, but also in terms of the way he thought about uh, organizing his work as a, also as a, an intelligence official and uh, uh, how to eventually uh, take charge of the, of the Mossad and take over the, the being being the head of the Mossad. So I think that um, this training also means that they uh, get a lot of the American, let's say, influence mm. and um, um, American magic yes. into the into the way they think operate, decision make, and, and so on and so forth, and the way they run their, uh, their employees. And, and I think that uh, another point is it's quite clear that Israel's reliance on uh, Western knowledge, especially American uh, knowledge, technology, uh, in the last, let's say, five, six decades, drove Israel to be very much influenced uh, from Western and, of course, uh, American uh, way of thinking, and that's uh, influencing uh, uh, state institutions, especially national security intelligence institutions like the Mossad. Uh, but yeah, I mean, on the other hand, I, w- I want to give also some uh, balancing uh, points uh, that uh, we really not need, we can't overstate the fact that Israel is really in the heart of uh, our Middle East. And 
significant part of the uh, Israeli Jews that immigrated immigrated to Israel in the late 40s after the establishment of Israel in 1948 and the early 50s throughout the 50s and 60s were immigrants from uh, Middle Eastern countries some of which became employees uh, employed by the Mossad or other intelligence institutions so I think they brought their culture also with um, so Israel is also influenced quite a lot by this uh, uh, Arabic, uh, Middle Eastern, uh, Muslim culture as well. Yeah, it's quite a melting pot of philosophies and ideas, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. So it's it's really interesting, yeah, case study, and I think it's, it needs further investigation. And it, it, of course, we need to interview more Israeli intelligence and ask them how do they feel about it. Um, and also it would be interesting to know, um, if you ask me, how do they, I mean, how could they chart the history of the institution of the Mossad and the way in which the Mossad treats itself as a Western institution mm. in the heart mm. of the Middle mm. East? Yeah. Western thinking, of course, Western culture and part of the Anglosphere, but at the same time, it's, it's located somewhere else, so it's, it's really interesting. And how it's, of course, what is their engagement with, that, with, this, uh, with this style of management, style of uh, uh, working uh, patterns and so on, mm. and how it affects their daily operation. Mm, mm. One random question popped into my head as you talked about technology earlier, and mm-hmm. um, you may not necessarily know the answer to this, so don't bore if you don't. But um, is there, you were mentioning earlier about like the reliance uh, a little bit on sort of American and Western technology, if I put it that way. Mm-hmm. Has there been a movement within the intelligence services to kind of build more domestic technology that they can rely on more so they're less reliant on Western technology? I'm not an expert on that. But I think Israel made, uh, especially in the last 20 years, a tremendous uh, path in that sense. Yeah. And there's so many high-tech and uh, startups uh, in Israel uh, born out of these ideas. So I, I think that the inspiration yeah. came from, uh, definitely from technology that was first of all yeah. imported. Uh, but yeah. then, uh, yeah, there's so many brilliant minds over there that took uh, took those, uh, you know, first bits of the golden nuggets and uh, elevate them to something else. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. I know Tel Aviv's like a top hub, isn't it, yeah. for technology? And I'm Absolutely. just thinking, I've tried to forget, I forgot the terminology for it, but I think Israel's sort of been leading the path a little bit on cyber warfare, the correct term, you like with Stuxnets mm-hmm. and things like that, with the um, uh, the targeted attacks on the Iranian um, nuclear facilities and things like that. And Israel's always been quite a leader on mm-hmm. that. One, one question that comes up often, actually, um, when speaking to intelligence historians like yourself, is access to information is obviously quite challenging challenging um and and i mm-hmm. believe in britain we have quite a, a i don't know if dysfunctional is the best word but a, a very erratic process of declassifying information and sometimes information gets reclassified as well i've spoken to a few historians who've been at the national archives and um you know things have sort of disappeared that they're working on or then there's even a selective process where some historians get access to things that other people can't for ages and so on and so forth so so what kind of challenges do you face as an intelligence historian and looking at the history of Israeli intelligence and um, why should interviews with key figures not be dismissed academically? Mm-hmm. Wow, this is a huge, uh, huge <laughs> two questions and I try to answer them <laughs> a little bit uh, separately. So, uh, But of course, they are intertwined. But I'll, I'll start with briefly saying that the challenges you mentioned in the British archives mm-hmm. and the British mm-hmm. historians uh, working on intelligence are similar uh, of course, and even to a higher extent in the Middle East and especially in Israel. It's also really arbitrary declassification of files. Some of them also disappear right in the middle of nowhere. Some get access to some files, some don't. It's really uh, arbitrary and uh, uh, unclear process. And the state always, uh, the censor always uh, uh, preserve itself the right to decide what should be classified, what not should be classified. There is a 30-year ruling on that, but they can extend it as much as they want, mm. as long as it meets the criteria of it could damage Israel's national security or its uh, uh, diplomatic relations. That puts the researcher in a point where lots of topics are fragmented, lots of periods are fragmented, and that's uh, that's 
let's say the starting point of this uh, the research of on almost any topic and now i i'm one of the researchers who believe that uh, national security and diplomacy are intertwined mm. and we are at least in israel lots of people tend to think that because there is a heavy censorship on the intelligence services archives like the mossad uh, and and the shirut abitachon aklali and aman and so on and they don't de- they basically hardly declassified anything you have access only to the ministry of foreign affairs files so yeah people tend to think that this artificial separation is really how things are also on the ground but they are not so they are basically this these two realms are intertwined and they are deeply uh, connected uh, and it means that uh, so at least the way I interpreted or how I translated mm. is uh, that we need to interview as a much more uh, diplomats intelligence uh, personnel and of course uh, the higher the rank is is the better um, but a variety of them is even uh, even better uh, from different periods also served in different parts of the world and Um, and have different experiences um, to fill these gaps. And this is a, a first step forward. Mm. I hope it starts to answer the question because it, it is a massive area. And I think that lots of scholars that work on uh, Israeli foreign policy and Israeli and national security are so busy with the micro research. Uh, we are all. Yes. We are really busy with our case studies, with our periods and so on. And there's not enough maybe pauses like uh, like this one to start uh, you know mapping the field trying to sketch some of those problems and try to solve them um, at least there is no not yet a really coherent process of doing it so it there's lots of small pieces of puzzles of many scholars who work on different small to- smaller topics yeah. Yeah, but uh, we need to work together a bit more and also share our knowledge in terms of the interviews we conduct and and th- th- for example there could be an archive of oral history built uh, only from interviews that uh, lots of scholars are doing but somehow they keep it for themselves <laughs> they keep their archive for themselves yeah well yeah for their book deals and what have you exactly yeah. <laughs> and that's also something I'm saying in this article that uh, I'm sharing my my interview with Faima Levy the night director of the Mossad because I really believe that some of the things he said could be useful for others and uh, it's just to say like this is my minor really modest contribution to the field and my argument yeah yeah excellent when your paper you talk about elite interviews and they can provide a deep insight in lieu of official documents um can you talk to us a little bit about sort of what your thoughts on elite interviews are so during my phd i conducted uh, around 30 interviews and in these interviews i tried to balance my uh, my interviews with the people who were available to talk to me mm. they had something mm. to do with the topic or the questions i was working on they served part of the period I was working on I was researching which is the late 70s and 80s and I was trying to really get a sense of um, their experience and their experience in the sense that uh, lots of the archival research uh, I've conducted showed me the institutional history and what exactly the Ministry of Foreign Affairs did or decide to do what kind of a policy did the Ministry of Foreign Affairs try to implement in a certain uh, situation but I was missing the the humanity point of view so the people's uh, perspective so in a lot of times you know people are that's what I learned from the interview that people are serving in different parts of the world okay and they have different agenda about a certain topic and they don't try to promote it the same way and As, as others in different parts of the of, of the mm. world and I will give an, a, an example I was working on in my uh, PhD thesis on Israeli support of Turkish denial on the Armenian genocide so Turkey denied the Armenian genocide and uh, back in the late 70s this topic emerged into the international fora into international relations it became a big question. whether or not Turkey should recognize the Armenian genocide. Mm. And in the context of a certain uh, historical and uh, geopolitical uh, events of the Middle East in the late 70s, Israel found itself in a position where it's doing everything it possibly can to support Turkey's position on this denial. And then I found that, and that's a spoiler for my book, that some diplomats had totally, even though they got the same request to do this or that, they 
try to implement it differently because they had some different views on this question, whether or not Israel as a country who uh, built on the ashes of the Holocaust. Commemorate the Holocaust as unique, as, as very important, right, part of its, um, its foundations uh, should help other countries to deny genocide of other people. Yeah. Um, so that was a moral question. Also, a little bit of, you know, we saw how, how these diplomats are have some rivalries between them. I mean, the diplomats who served in Turkey, for example, so this is a top priority, as very important, as something that cannot take any, you know, this cannot get a, a lower priority than top, top one. And uh, we saw diplomats in the United States uh, that were hmm, a little bit, uh, that we have uh, more, more important things to, to do in our schedule. So, uh, and that this is uh, it's really interesting. And the elite interviews, those interviews with them, I could see some of those tensions in the, in the documents I read, mm. but only after I interviewed these diplomats and officials, I could really study their personal views about this. So it gave a sense of humanity and sense of emotion to those questions, and it uh, filled the gaps where I needed some more information about what exactly happened. Yeah, yeah. Now, forgive me, what is the academic name to the approach where you um looking at the lived experience? Constructivist, yeah. Can you talk just a little bit about it? Well, that was really interesting. Constructivism is a social theory in international relations that uh, examines factors like uh, identities, values, norms, and even uh, religion, and how do they uh, shape for policy decision-making in the international politics. In contrast to realism that emphasized the importance of uh, the nation-state as a, as a category of analysis, uh, in, in constructivism we look at the uh, factors that goes beyond the nation-state, for example, how international organizations uh, uh, with their own set of norms and values, like uh, the UN or the EU, uh, shape uh, world politics. Also, it gives us a great chance to uh, examine and think about uh, individual uh, players, like uh, foreign ministers, uh, prime ministers, uh, presidents, and what is their value, what is their input in uh, world politics, and uh, how do they shape uh, decision-making. Yeah, makes a lot of sense, makes mm -hmm. a lot of sense. I mean, uh, kind of reminds me of the humanist approach in the psychology because it's very easy academically to mm -hmm. discount the role of the individual. Um, so, yeah, I think that's a very sort of uh, mm -hmm. wise approach. I mean, I'm a bit of a, a magpie when it comes to approaches, so it's a bit of uh, realism of a bit of uh, constructivism sounds quite quite sort of a good way to look at things, I think. <laughs> yeah, and, and exactly this mm. is where the, the elite interviews fits in because yeah. elite interviews really look at the, how the, the individual and from the as I mentioned before from the bottom to the top how things are being managed in, in the sense of uh, uh, not the not, not only the institutions but also the the, the real people okay? the people mm. let if we mm. look at even if I gave an example on Erdogan or Netanyahu or even Putin okay you move one of these guys out of the picture mm. okay how would some of the country's decision would look like totally different so the weight this people are carrying and the weight they have on foreign policy, on decision making, on not just decision making, but on, on, on really on uh, building even new state institutions that project their values and their uh, uh, interests. Mm. It's a fascinating angle to look at, uh, at foreign policy at, at international politics. The old paradigms and the realistic paradigms look only on the, on the state level, the state institutions as the decision maker. No, but behind them, there are people. And sometimes, say, less democratic it becomes mm. on the scale. Mm. Yeah, and moving to authoritarianism and then to a complete, uh, let's say, uh, dictatorship. Yeah. The role of the individual makes even uh, uh, the extent of his uh, impact is much higher. Yeah, yeah, indeed, indeed. Well, one individual you did focus on in your, your dissertation was um, Ephraim Halavi, who was the ninth director of Mossad. Can you talk to us about how that interview sort of came about, sort of what you learned from him, and if anything he said sort of surprised or challenged you? Yeah, first of all, the, interviews, the interview with him was um, in my first year uh, 
as a PhD mm. candidate. And that was a point in my uh, PhD studies where I just, you know, try to think of the materials mm. I already have, try to think of a chapter outline, uh, write a literature review, let's say an initial liter literature review, and try to situate my, my questions, the questions that I had in mind, uh, into a broader uh, framework. I knew already on the period I'm working, but all the other things were not uh, were not right enough uh, yet. Mm. And these interviews that I conducted in the first round of my uh, in my first field research, and uh, one of them was a primal mm. levy, really helped me to okay. So this is that's your direction. This is your so a lot of things that he and others said really gave me some. It shed some light on the mm. questions I had but it also gave me new uh, uh, directions for research, which I found uh, fascinating. But specifically, this interview, the, the interview I had with him is started with, we, we met, um, and, and when we started talking, you know, I introduced mm. myself and talked to him about my, the topic of my dissertation, and uh, I told him about the consent form, consent form he mm. needed to mm. sign, because there is ethical guidelines to interviewing, and I present them and so on. Uh, to the doctoral committee, he started asking me questions. So I was sitting, I was sitting there in the table with him, and he said, "So, why are you in the Netherlands? <laughs> what are you doing there?" Yeah, yeah. So I start, you know, explaining. So the inner intelligence officer coming out there, <laughs> and it's it's a it's a really interesting combination between being nice and kind, at the same time very firm and. Uh, you can't bullshit this guy. <laughs> you know, he's very, so he knows. So he's, so he's asking, what is your wife doing over there? Are you planning to come back mm. to Israel when you mm. are graduating your PhD? And do you think he knew some of the answers in advance to check you out? <laughs> I think I think he did. Uh, he just wanted to hear what I had to say and uh, how am I answering, if I'm being genuine about stuff that I'm answering. Yeah. And I think a big plus is the fact that we can speak Hebrew. And uh, we, we, I mean, this... There's no cultural uh, borders between us in the sense that we understand each other very well. And I think it helps. And then and at one second, he said, he opened his watch and he said, in 60 minutes, I have another meeting <laughs> and it's firm. You have 60 minutes starting now. Go. Wow. <laughs> and so, you know, it's a, it's a guy that before, previously, I only saw on TV or newspapers and uh, here and there, you know, in the media, and sitting with him and talking to him about my research and uh, asking some real questions really gave me a feeling that I'm getting very close to, let's say, the empirical evidence I need to present in my thesis in order to argue something that I would like to argue. And another thing that comes up in, in these interviews quite a lot, not just with Alevi, that lots of times they refer to someone else they knew, which you never heard of, mm. uh, another official. Sometimes you did hear, heard about him, but they say, you know what, you should talk to this guy or that guy. Why won't you do that? And then they, they refer to you, to this individual, and they say, I have his connection, his connection info if you want, and uh, maybe you should ask him these questions, and this is a great follow-up. Yeah. Um, especially when they give you the, let's say, green light to contact him if they have the contact info. So it, a lot of time it happens. So it happens also with Levy and uh, some other people. Sometimes, I mean, it really depends on the individual, mm, mm. but they ask for the consent of the uh, other official if they if they can provide his uh, contact info. And sometimes they don't. They just tell you, you know, you should speak to this guy or that guy. They're not kind uh, to that extent, but they, it's still it's really it's really useful, and it's something I will cherish. And you know, last I will tell you one more thing, and this is maybe most of the listeners uh, of this podcast don't know. Up until 1996, the head of the Mossad was anonymous. It was not published uh, anywhere. I mean, uh, only mm. you know the people who need to know knew, knew it, but it was not publicly announced. Uh, only when he retired, they used to announce his name. There was lots of uh, uh, criticism about this in Israel back in the mid-90s. So th they decided, the, the Supreme Court decided to change this uh, decision and publicly announce his name. The argument was always, uh, has been that he's, he can travel around the world, he doesn't have to, you know, disguise his identity, and uh, he can travel safely and so on. 
But I think the world a little bit changed after uh, in the end of the Cold War, the, 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 you know, the happy days of the 90s. Yeah. There, there were, and of, of course, you know, the internet revolution, it changed a lot of things. The accessibility we have to these people, they have an email, they have a smartphone. You can, if you have their number, you can text them, you can email them. I mean, they, of course, can decide not to answer. They can ignore and everything else. But the idea is that why I'm telling you this, because uh, 20, 30 years ago, I could dream about uh, interviewing the head of the Mossad if I was a PhD student. Mm -hmm. And the internet revolution, the the technology brought so many uh, opportunities to research students and scholars generally Mm. to interview people like him and others. That's uh, that's amazing, and we, we should use this opportunity to create knowledge and to learn more from their experience because these guys, they know about so many things. They know mm, so much, mm. really. Well, one thing I've learned from interviewing people is you ne- may not necessarily um, always get all the facts of everything, but you do get an insight into the mindset, and then it can you can almost put yourself in that person's shoes a little bit and speculate, mm-hmm. obviously you can only speculate, of maybe how something went down. Um, and I, I've always found that quite interesting. You're definitely right. I mean, this is the case also with, uh, especially with uh, a guy like Fima Levy, mm. the head of the Mossad. He never, they never get into the details. They to- t- tell you generally about things that they were doing, but they never go into the specifics. And that's okay. We don't have to know about the nuts and bolts of everything they have done, and they will never tell us. They know the limitations of what they can say or not say. But the thing is, that if you, if one is preparing his questions uh, well, and uh, you know who you're talking to, you know also you are familiar with his autobiography. You want to know things that he never wrote anywhere, um, and you want to know more specific information that is tailored to your to one's research, to one's uh, dissertation, to one's book, and that's what I was doing too. So. Mm. And that's something that uh, it, 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 it improved, it got uh, better and better as, as I go. I mean, uh, I, I uh, improved myself and the way in which I conducted those interviews as I go. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's it. That's, that's all you can do, isn't it? That's the best thing. So thank you very much for your time today. Before we do wrap up, is there anything else that we've talked about today that you would like to add before we wrap up? Let me think. Uh, now the, there is the question I want to ask you. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> sure. Um, I hope it's not about cycling habits. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, uh, because I'm I'm into interviewing and yeah. podcasting is, of course, part of interviewing. So I'm really interested in your world as a, you, you, you have a really successful podcast. Um, how does it feel to run such a successful pod- podcast and how do you actually, how do you do it? Yeah, thank you. Well, um, I've made it part of my routine. Um, that's the first sort of thing uh, because it's very easy. I, I've seen many podcasts start and disappear, mm-hmm. and I've even been part of a podcast that, uh, but prior to this one, that was too big a effort. Um, so I think we well, the first thing I did was weigh up where podcasting fits into the importance of my day to day life because I mm-hmm. I don't make my living through the podcast; I make it through other things. But I knew I could commit to maybe uh, once or twice a month, um, and I sort of part, built it as part of my sort of routine now so um and the other thing i found is a bit like with your interview there's a bit of a snowball effect once you start interviewing certain people it becomes a little bit easier to interview other people over time because you've got a bit of a sort of track record and so on um and it's a great for me personally it's a great responsibility as well because information um especially when you're broadcasting information is a responsibility and i think some people forget that and i think like with a topic as loaded as the world of intelligence and uh, there's a lot of sort of nonsense out there sure. um and so again it's sort of qualifying the guest that you have on is a big part of it as well. Who are we talking to? You've got to do your sort of homework a little bit and make sure. Because mm-hmm. I, I get approached by all sorts of people and and, um, yeah. and I've approached a lot of people who've turned me down too. But um, but there yeah. are, I do get occasionally the odd um, 
person who contacts me and I'm not sure about them and if there's no and if they haven't got anything to show um then I, I kind of I just leave them be kind of thing and again same with um spy fiction as much as I love spy fiction is just finding the time to cover it but <laughs> mm-hmm. it, it's so hard so I tend to so I, I I'm very selective and snobby about spy fiction I tend to just pick um fiction that's come from people who've worked in the world of intelligence or have a very close connection like um I mean like something like I haven't interviewed David Ignatius, but he's somebody I'd love to interview one day. And he's never been, as far as I know, a serving intelligence officer, but he is very connected to the world of intelligence. Some of his novels have even, 20 years down the line, the non-fiction version of his novels come out. I love that book, Agents of Innocence. And that the, the non-fiction story that that was based on came out about uh, 10 years ago. It was a book called The Good Spy by, is it Kai Bird? Who's, again, somebody mm-hmm. else I'd love to interview at some point. Um, <laughs> so it's, yeah. So it, I think, for me, it's just become part of my routine. And like you were saying earlier about yourself, you're very kind of curious, and I, I've always have been. And I was always the kid who was told off for talking too much in class. So so kind of podcasting is the perfect medium for me, really. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sounds like it. <laughs> sounds, sounds like a great, uh, a great medium for you. Yeah, no, I've really enjoyed it. And I get a lot of satisfaction from it because I, as I was saying to you earlier off air, you know, my, my sort of day works involving with film. Um, and obviously my, my sort of paid livings from corporate film, but my ambitions always been with fiction and drama and, um, the part about fiction and drama is a very long-winded process to getting projects actually off the ground. And, and so like the podcast started based on research from a short film I made and I was just sitting on information because as a filmmaker, sometimes you are just sitting on information that may, may or may not, um, see the light of day. And podcasting is quite satisfying because you can kind of just dive into a topic um, with someone and have some immediacy from it. And that's something that's always been a bit lacking in my life is something to show for things. Uh, and so podcasting, photography and cookery are my main things, really, because I feel like I have something to show for my efforts. <laughs> Whilst filmmaking mm-hmm. can be quite <laughs> elusive sometimes and then eventually I have something to show for my efforts. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice wow that's uh no it's it's uh, i think it's a great outlet for you to to you. Uh, supplement the uh, the producing part and uh, feel feeling something that uh that you're passionate about but still yeah. uh, cannot fulfill on a day-to-day basis yeah so that's yeah great. exactly and it's good homework i yeah. mean all these interviews i hope through osmosis kind of translate to better hopefully better fiction work in time because believe mm-hmm. you me there's a lot of really bad spy fiction out there um I'm sure. uh, 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 and so i i you know um maybe i set too high standards for myself but i just you know i'm trying my best to sort of do stuff that has an authentic feeling um you know i was That's always important. yeah and i've always been a big fan of um like the filmmaker Michael Mann and John Frankenheimer and those kind of directors because they their films, sometimes they are, you know, they're not very realistic, but they feel realistic and they've got a lot of research behind them, you know. I mean, films like yeah. Heat, uh, such a great movie. Um, mm-hmm. Even to some extent, um, elements of Collateral has got a lot of reality to it and even mm-hmm. uh, the movie Miami Vice has a lot of reality next to the fantasy. So it's, uh, yeah, it's all good stuff. <laughs> great. Wow, that's a great answer. Thanks a lot. That's, uh... My pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's cool. Thank you for your time today. Where can the listeners sort of find out more about you and your work and potentially connect with you? So I think there are two main outlets, or let's say three. Uh, my LinkedIn page, mm. my, my work can be downloaded in my uh, academia.education page, yeah. and also my Twitter, which is uh, used mainly for uh, my academic work. Um, so we can include it also uh, there. That's, I think, uh, that's uh, basically it uh, in terms of uh, what to find me and uh, my work and to read my yeah. Yeah. Uh, my uh, publications and uh, and follow my work. Yeah, well, well, thank you so much for your time today. It's been a real pleasure sure. to chat with you. Sure, it's my pleasure and thanks for uh, this wonderful chat. Thank you. Thanks for listening. This is Secrets and Spies. 